Ah, finally, free from the dumb prison. <laughs> ah, what the fuck? Hello and welcome back to Gamebox, the show where we take a look at games of yesteryear. And today we'll be taking a look at a game from the PlayStation 3 era. A game that had some pretty big shoes to fill, as it was a sequel to a very well received game. A game that tried some new things, but still wanted to stay within that established comfort zone. A game that was almost never made. A little game called The Chronicles of Riddick Assault on Dark Athena. <laughs> Developed by Starbreeze Studios and published by Atari and Tygon Studios. After the release of Escape from Butcher Bay, our friends at Starbreeze were not in the best place financially, as at the time they had yet to receive royalties from Vivendi for their work on Butcher Bay. Though it was seen as a critical success, it wasn't seen as a financial one, which added to the financial strain. But the silver lining in the grey cloud was that Butcher Bay cemented Starbreeze street cred for making some top shelf licensed games. With the help of Union Entertainment, Starbreeze was able to sign an agreement with Majesco Entertainment to work on a title set in the Darkness Universe which had its own difficulties, but after the dust settled, Starbreeze could add another notch to their belt. Now with two licensed games under their belt, Starbreeze was riding a high wanting to work on an original title. That title was Kano, and unfortunately, this project was never completed. After the release of The Darkness, Starbreeze signed a two-project agreement with Vivendi. And I know what you're thinking, why would they sign a deal with a company they had issues with in the past? Well, I don't know, but they did and moving on. One of the projects in the two project deal was Polaris. This game was a multiplayer focused game where the player was tasked with defeating monsters and terrorists all while having to deal with the sandstorm. Sounds interesting right? And once again, unfortunately, Vivendi wasn't filling Polaris and adjusted the contract to instead be a remake of Escape from Butcher Bay. Vivendi also wanted this new project to be called Riddick 2. This was something Starbreeze didn't agree with as they felt the name would unnecessarily raise the expectations of the fans of the original game. As things were looking up for Starbreeze, a merger occurred in 2008 between Activision and Vivendi, which ended up forming Activision Blizzard. This merger also resulted in the announcement that Dark Athena was being dropped. This made the future of the game very uncertain. So there are several things that can happen to a game in this particular situation. It could be forgotten with all that work fading to obscurity, like in the case of Scalebound. A highly unfortunate outcome. Or it could be picked up by another studio and completed, making it a continuation, like in the case of Darksiders 3. Or it could be picked up and remade into a new project altogether, only keeping the title of the game, like in the case of Prey. Or it can be picked up and reworked into a new game altogether, but still keeping the essence of what that project was. A reboot, much like Tomb Raider, and then reboot it again. Each one is a choice no developer wants to face. But for Dark Athena, things were a bit more hopeful, as in September 2008, Starbreeze stated that Dark Athena was still being worked on and was nearing completion, but it was in need of a publisher. Thankfully, in October 2008, Infograms, the parent company of Atari, had obtained the rights to Dark Athena. More work was done on the game that shifted focus from a remake to a full-on sequel. A thing to note is Dark Athena was packaged with the remake of Escape from Butcher Bay. This version of the original game upgraded the graphics as well as adding a section where Riddick takes control of Riot Armor. They even improved the controls, mapping the aiming to the L2 button and changing the weapon selection method. The only thing I didn't like about the remake was whenever Riddick would do certain actions, the background would blur out which made it hard to keep an eye on your surroundings. They also changed the eye shine effect, but overall the game was still very fun. Assault on Dark Athena brought back Vin Diesel it's all about family, Tom. to voice Riddick. But Cole Hauser did not return to voice Johns, which made sense as he didn't speak during the duration of the game. Dark Athena was released on Windows, Xbox 360, and PlayStation 3 in North America on April 7, 2009, and in Europe on April 27, 2009. It was also released for Mac worldwide on April 16, 2010. The reception for Dark Athena was pretty good, much like its predecessor, earning mostly 8s and 9s. And with that, let's take a look at today's game. What have you done with... Him. Said after the events of Escape from Butcher Bay, 
Johns and Riddick are afloat in the darkness of space when their ship is intercepted by a merc ship by the name of the Dark Athena. Johns is taken prisoner by the Captain Revis. Now once again, Riddick must stab, shoot, and punch whoever it takes to escape the clutches of this new foe. So the goal of any sequel would be to add to a project that came before it. And for the most part, Dark Athena does just that. The controls are reworked, making it feel a lot smoother than Butcher Bay. This time around, the gunplay feels a lot better. The aiming was reworked having it mapped to the L2 button, giving it a more modern feel, though not completely ADS, but it does allow for more accurate aiming. They even swapped out the weapon selection method, going with the weapon wheel opposed to a single button that was used for cycling available items of mayhem, which made the selection process much easier. Riddick did feel a bit slower when it came to moving around for stealth, but nothing too bad. The hand-to-hand -hand combat was just as good as its predecessor. The usual suspects for weapons come into play in the form of a combat knife, a hairpin, I know it sounds weird but it's important, there is also a baton, but the ones that shine here are the Ulocks, the curved blades that were seen in the Chronicles of Riddick film. This was a weapon I tended to stick with for most of the combat encounters, and this was due to them being the most effective weapon in the game. As for gunplay, the OGs return. There's the pistol, the rifle, the shotgun, and the tranquilizer gun. Now there are a few new faces to be seen, those being the SMG, the scar gun, a gun that fires out a round that can be remotely detonated, and the sniper rifle, which I didn't pick up as it was tied to a side mission that I didn't bother to finish. But I was able to complete the game without it, so safe to assume it wasn't going to be missed. Even with the gunplay feeling as smooth as it did, I did take note of an auto lock when aiming. This sometimes felt like more of a hindrance than a help as it led to me shooting the enemy's cover opposed to the enemies the shots were meant for. The ice mechanic made a return as well. The effect was toned down. It did also feel like the range was toned down as well, but that may have just been me. But the overall experience played pretty similar to Butcher Bay. The levels this time around felt a bit more linear than those found in Butcher Bay, which normally isn't a bad thing. But here it wasn't exactly fun. Not horrible, just that it did tend to lean into the realm of tedium. A prime example is where Riddick needed an item in order to progress, but he had to go to a different section of the ship, then come back, only to get tasked to head out for a different item in another part of the ship, then come back. I don't know, it didn't feel right here. Where in Butcher Bay, Riddick did have to backtrack, but there it felt like each step was making the story go forward. Here it just felt like padding. There are parts where Riddick can take control of a mech or a drone and fight his way through hordes of enemies, but these sections were short lived. The environment does switch it up when Riddick is allowed to roam around a small town, though in this section of the game Riddick has access to the scar gun, and given that this gun lets Riddick explodify enemies, one would think that this would make this section a hoot, yeah? Well actually, I found this part of the game to be pretty boring. With the slow rate of fire of the gun, and just all around bland environment, this part of the game wasn't my favorite, it did seem to drag on for a bit longer than it should have. The bosses here once again walk on the easy side of the road. I was able to hide behind cover and just unload on them, or use the Ulocks and unleash an unblockable barrage of attacks. So yeah, they were just... eh. I will give Dark Athena this. It does look very good. The updated graphics and lighting do hold up even now. The color palette went from a dark and dirty look that was Butcher Bay to a clean and dull look that was the Dark Athena. So it wasn't bad. The voice work is just as good as it was in Butcher Bay. The music worked much like it did in its predecessor, as it really kicks in during the action moments, after which it fades to make way for the more ambient tracks. I did come across several glitches during my run. None of them were game breaking, but they were annoying. One of those being when my gun decided to stop shooting, leading to an unfair death. So yeah, annoying. So all in all, is this a game you need to go out and play? Mm. I'm going to give a soft yes. Assault on Dark Athena does make improvements in terms of gameplay over its predecessor, making the gunplay easier this time around. It even added more weapons for Riddick to play with, but this didn't add to the fun meter. The atmosphere of Dark Athena was spot on, but was gone once I set foot in the town. To some, this game is viewed more as an expansion than a full on game, and it's easy to see why. To be honest, I felt there was something missing from Dark Athena, but I can't put my finger on it. Maybe it's how the gameplay didn't really have that same kick that Butcher Bay did. Where in Butcher Bay, I did tend to use each of the melee weapons in different situations that called for it, but in Dark Athena I didn't do that. I tended only to use the Ulocks, which in turn made each encounter same same. But the trade off to that was that the gunplay felt better. Yeah, the environments did kind of lose some of that pizzazz that was present in Butcher Bay, more so in the later part of the game. 
but when aboard Dark Athena, it does hit some of those same notes. The backtracking did get a bit overused, and did leave a bad taste in my mouth. Where Butcher Bay did handle different gameplay types very well, here it seemed to favor gunplay over the other forms, which was a bit of a shame. A change, yeah for sure, but still a shame nonetheless. There is even a multiplayer component to Dark Athena, but at the time of recording, I couldn't get it to work. But if you can get jiggy with that, then I say give it a try. Hell, if you wanted to, you can buy it to play the updated version of Butcher Bay if you haven't played the original. That's fine too. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a ship to escape from. Hey, welcome to the end of the video. I thank you for making it this far. It was interesting going back through these two games. One was fantastic, while the other, not so much. But for our next game, we'll be taking a look at a more recent game. Actually, when I bought it, it was still new, but yeah. A game that takes inspiration from the late HP Lovecraft. But until then, you know what to do. Spread the awesome, and I will see you next time.